It was great to hear Jill's very moving land acknowledgement, and I second that. Um, the Quinnipiac and, and other peoples who have been the custodians of these lands, I, I'd like to add to that an acknowledgement of the people whose ancestors were brought here without their consent and whose labors contributed so centrally to the wealth of this university uh, and to its buildings and to every aspect of its work. Uh, and that is relevant to the seminar. Um, I wanted to start by saying that what we'll do it together in this seminar is to work through the idea that in works of art, in the visual heritage of humanity, um, we have the materials to explore difficult questions in the present. Um, and as usual, artists are way ahead of everyone else. So when we look at this painting by Sonia Boyce uh, from 1988, um, she was asking us to think about the role of Afro-descended people in history, in relation to the modern city. She's a, a black British artist who lives in, in London, and that's what she's thinking through in this uh, work um, uh, from 1988. What role have black and indigenous peoples played in building the monuments uh, that, you know, like this, this room this, this, uh, and, and this institution, and every town uh, in this country uh, has that shared history. Sonia is asking us how much of London's architecture was paid for by slavery and the, uh, and the Atlantic uh, um, uh, economic endeavor. So although art history as such uh, is not a subject usually offered even in high schools, I think looking at art is something that every classroom should, uh, should find a way to do because our whole world is now conveyed to us by screens. I mean, I started at Yale in 1998 and a screen was a thing with a little green flashing, you know, letters, only letters on it. There were no pictures, no images. And if you think of the transformation in our universe, that most of the information that most people from the age of, I don't know, two, 18 months get, get from the outside world, it comes through images now. And we need the skills to analyze those images. Art history has been waiting 500 years for this moment, right? Since, <laughs> since the Reformation, when the word took over, when Luther said it's all about the word, now it's all about the image. And so if we uh, can persuade um, everyone in the world, but especially in classrooms, especially digital natives, kids who've grown up with no other world, to stop look slowly and think about images. Where does this come from? What is it telling us? How does it work? How is it working in ways that we may not be conscious of? Um, you know, what are the visual traditions that an image sits in? This, I think, is what art history's work is in the present world. So even if you don't know it, if you're teaching kids to look at images critically, you are an art historian. Welcome aboard. <laughs> um, you know, because that's what, that's what we've been trying to do all this time. It also means that art museums suddenly become as important as libraries and as websites for understanding the past because the past is enshrined in not just million dollar paintings, but drawings, photographs, magazine uh, images, you know, and of course, every image on the internet. So um, in this seminar, um, I, I thought we would think historically about this to go back to the moment of contact between Europe and the Americas, 1492, up to the end of the Civil War, and use, um, you know, while, while you're here, use materials that are available on, the, in, on this campus, which has extraordinary museum collections. Everything in those museums is digitized and free use, so you can use it, uh, you know, wherever you are. But it also, I hope, will help uh, fellows to think about how they could use um, historic sites or even place names or landscapes Every town, every city, every you know, small area in this country has something historical that you can use for, for teaching. So it's, it's a model of how to, how to do that. Let's start with this guy, Elihu Yale, a word from our sponsor, right? Um, he's the fat guy in the middle with the wig. Uh, and he was a product of the British Empire. He was born in New England to a Welsh family. He made his money in India smuggling diamonds. Uh, the whole thing is, is slightly illegitimate um, uh, from that point of view. I'm interested in this portrait, not because of the named people in the title, um, but what happens if we think from the point of view of this young man here, and we look closely and we see that he's wearing a silver necklace, silver bracelet, a, a locked 
symbol of his enslavement, a horrifying image. This picture was kept in deep storage until two of my grad students said, you've got to get that out, and we've got to look at this thing, and we have to face up to the histories that it represents. And now the museum is indeed doing deep, deep research on it. But what does the whole history of art look like if we look at it from the point of view of the people who are officially marginalized in this record? Not so interesting then that Yale is stitching up a marriage contract so that he's, uh, you know, he's, he's marrying off his daughter. More interesting that he's part of this economic system, which is one of grotesque and horrifying injustice. Um, and in fact, if we go back to the very earliest works of um, British art made in relation to this hemisphere, uh, so this is John White, a very early uh, and, and failed venture in, 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 in Elizabethan colonialism. We can look at these, uh, these drawings and look at the world that was here before colonialism and look at the, uh, the, the, the record that is available through, um, through European uh, representations. We can also think about other ways that indigenous cultures are represented through stories and through, through surviving objects. And also look at the fact that when John White saw this man, he was fascinated by him because this was a person who was a healer, um, a, a, so, someone who, who was involved in, in, in forms of medicine that John White from England didn't understand. And he couldn't visualize this sort of what he thought was a flyer, a magician, without looking at the history of Western art. So he looked into the work of the Italian artist Giambologna, the god Mercury, and you'll see how he's turned this indigenous man who he actually encountered into a figure connected to the history of Western art. That's the critical looking. Every image on the internet has a history like that, and we have to start unpicking it because that carries values with it. Um, and then these are objects which a student of mine said, you know, why don't you talk about these in your class? And the answer is because I didn't know they were in the library. Um, uh, and so we started to look at these representations of Jamaican uh, Christmas festival called John Canoe, which was a moment when enslaved people in Jamaica, and this is just after the end of uh, a formal slavery in 1837, but enslaved people dressed up in costumes which were both, if you look at the guy on the left, a kind of, oh, this guy, a kind of satire of the enslavers, a sort of deliberate turning of the world on its head. But then in a figure like the, this guy, this fantastic image of a performer done up in this incredible costume, um, uh, research uh, demonstrated that what he did was to recite scenes from Shakespeare. Um, and he was standing on the, on the steps of the town hall in Kingston, Jamaica, in plain sight, this fantastic annual sort of spectacle. But what nobody uh, at the time realized is that these symbols here are actually from a Congolese uh, religious um, uh, cosmography, which actually means that his, his body was telling a completely different story from what his mouth was telling. So a research in art history, and we'll, we'll spend some time looking at these materials together, uh, can actually reveal aspects of an image which we, you know, this is actually, I saw it on a, on a wall in a hotel in Kingston, Jamaica. It's like, you know, we're proud of it, it's beautiful. But what stories can it tell if we give it some time, spend some time with it? And that's true of images which are reproduced in horrible black and white in every you know, old history textbook and you know, the, the sort of thing that your, your, your parents and grandparents probably were taught in, in high school. But what if we look to the side of this picture and actually acknowledge the presence of people of color in a work like this. John Trumbull uh, donated this picture, the, the death of General Warren at the Battle of Bunkers Hill, 17th of June, 1775. And um, you know, research has identified this African-American man as Peter Salem, who shot Major Pitcairn, um, uh, and thus ensuring the success, or one of the reasons that the, the American patriots were successful. Maybe if it weren't for this guy on the right, you would all sound like me. <laughs> Just imagine that. Uh, that wouldn't be so great. Um, and uh, finally, you know, let's look at objects which are outside the usual canon of fine art, the things that you get in your art history textbook if you, if you teach the subject in you know, first year university. You would never see a thing like this, but this beautiful pot is on show just now at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. If any of you are from that area or can get there, try and see this exhibition. David Drake, we now know his name, uh, Dave the Potter, he was, he, he, he was known as, uh, he signed these beautiful big storage jars that he made. He was a man who had a terrible accident early in his life, lost both his legs. So he sat there with another uh, man, the two of them together, the, um, the man with legs was moving the, 
you know, moving the, the turning around the, the, the potter's wheel so that, and Dave would shape these pots with his hands and then he signed them with a thumb. So you can see Dave's thumbprint in these objects. They're some of the most beautiful, splendid objects in the Metropolitan Museum alongside the Greek sculpture, the Egyptian, the Michelangelo. Um, and there they are now getting their recognition. And you know, what I want to do is to find things like this to talk about, which your students, <clears throat> K through 12, might find that everyone's tried to make a pot. But then, you know, think about the, um, you know, think about David Drake, an enslaved man making these objects of enormous beauty, which are on show um, now in the Metropolitan Museum. So these are really sensitive issues for discussion. And we need to think very carefully about language together, about pedagogy, about how to introduce questions of race and representation into uh, an approach which, uh, which is right for each community. And this is where I want to learn from you about how students at all levels you know, will respond to this work. There's a lot of new academic work to share, um, but what's really important is that we think together about imaginative ways to think about you know, American history, world history, language arts, social studies. I think in all those fields, these, these objects will, will tell a story, and I look forward to um, learning from you. Thank you.